We're talking about, this is the, the theme of the entire workshop, right? The making of Mexican Texas. But what we spent time last week talking about was really leading up to when Mexico became independent. And where we started with the conversation was where my Texas history teacher started the class when I took Texas history in seventh grade, which is with Moses Austin coming in. Um, and as I said, you know, we used to teach this a long time ago as, you know, Moses Austin comes in and Texas is a wilderness and you begin Anglo colonization. And that's really the beginning of the story. But as we talked about last week, that doesn't really make any sense because Moses Austin's coming in, but he's coming into a landscape that has a big, deep, long history that you guys just talked about where you are in your classrooms. And a lot of you are either in Spanish colonial or just finished Spanish colonial. And laying the groundwork during that Spanish colonial period of how Texas was never really controlled by the Spanish, things were falling apart in all kinds of ways, particularly as we talked about last week in the 18 teens leading up to 1820, helps us understand, helps our students understand why when Moses Austin comes into San Antonio, you know, that the Spaniards in Texas would be even vaguely interested in listening to what he had to say. The other thing that we talked about that was a really big part of the story of Moses Austin coming in in 1820 with his crazy proposal is of what was happening in the United States during the 18 teens with the cotton revolution and the explosion of migration into places like Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana that had been expanding the American South and cotton and therefore slavery, which is something else we're gonna talk about more today, um, making its way westward, right? And those things come together when Moses Austin, after the Panic of 1819, decides to come into Texas and ask permission uh, to settle Anglo families in Texas, all right? And he's, he's, he's told yes by the Tejanos, the Spaniards who live in Texas who are about to become Mexicans, right? And so, it's Stephen F. Austin who carries on that legacy. You know, Moses ends up dying not long after getting permission to bring Anglo families in. And Stephen F. Austin comes in and he's gonna be working with the Tejanos in San Antonio. And, and this is something I always emphasize to my students and I wanna to emphasize to you guys. And I think it's something that we need to talk about more in the seventh grade or fourth grade or whichever classrooms you guys are in, that this was not just Anglos coming into Texas, and it, was just, it wasn't just the Tejanos in Texas making this happen. It's Anglos like Stephen F. Austin and Tejanos like Jose Antonio Navarro in this picture here, who are coming together to bring Americans into Texas during the Mexican period, right? It is a combination of these two sides who both need each other to make this happen, who are collaborating and are a team in what's about to happen and what's going forward from here. And that's gonna be really important to understand what happens really throughout the entire 1820s and early 1830s in Texas, all right? The other context point to, to remind our students is that it's at the moment that Stephen F. Austin comes into Texas, the summer of 1821, when Mexico becomes independent of Spain. And this is really confusing for students because the timeline is so, overlapping, right? Moses gets permission from Spain in 1820. Stephen F. Austin's coming over to what he thinks is Spanish territory, but as he rides into Texas, he learns that Mexico is suddenly, in 1821, independent of Mexico, because that Mexican war for independence that began way back in 1810 um, has finally succeeded by 1821, and there's a lot of, there's a long story there, there's a lot of history that we don't have time to get into. But the short version is this guy over here, um, Augustin de Iturbide. He's a royal Spanish military officer who joins the rebels. And basically he marches into Mexico City in 1821 and the, and the, the revolution is complete. Mexico is independent. But the question is what's going to become not just of Mexico, what's gonna become of Texas and what's gonna become of this this colony, supposed colony of, of people from the United States, and Stephen F. Austin has permission, or his dad got permission, from the Spanish government, not this new Mexican nation that has just appeared. And so Stephen F. Austin has this real moment of, of fear when he gets to San Antonio in, he gets there in August of 1821, and he realizes 
once Mexico is independent, he has a contract with Spain, but not with Mexico, and he's not quite sure what to do with all of this, all right? But the Tejanos in San Antonio, this is what we talked about at the end of, of last week, the Tejanos in San Antonio desperately want the Anglo colony to happen because it's gonna bring, they hope, stability to the region, migrants from the United States who will become farmers and bring stability, but also bring the cotton economy that has been booming in the United States, that is booming in places like New Orleans, that will bring it to Texas and bring prosperity with it. So the Tejanos in San Antonio tell Stephen F. Austin, hey, yes, this is a new country now, it's Mexico, we don't know what that's gonna mean, but the Tejanos say, go ahead and start your colony. We'll vouch for you, we'll advocate for you, we'll make sure that whatever, whatever this new government is, it's gonna support what you're doing. And so it's with that promise that Stephen F. Austin goes off and starts building his colony, all right? And so as I structure this for my students, um, you know, I always try to get them to look at this uh, perspective or look at what happens next from the perspective of the people who are a part of it. So in this case, I like them to look at this from Stephen F. Austin's perspective. What were Austin's goals in establishing his colony? You have to understand that if you're gonna understand what he does and how he structures things when he builds the colony. And then that helps us understand the second essential question here. What did he do to establish those goals? What was his priorities? Because it helps us understand the way he structures things that are going to have a long-term influence in what's going on in Texas, all right? So Mexico becomes independent. Stephen F. Austin goes out to uh, establish his colony. And he has a lot of support from Mexicans at all levels because Mexico realized that it was in, it had inherited a really giant um, difficult situation from the Spanish, not just in Texas, but nationwide. Um, Mexico, when it becomes independent, is basically dead broke. It is surrounded by enemies. Um, the Spanish, who they just became free of, don't accept Mexico's independence and are threatening to invade. And then they will in the late 1820s as well. Um, but when Mexico decides, is, is building itself as a new nation, they put together a commission to try to figure out which problems Mexico as a country needs to, to tackle first. And when they send, when this commission puts in a report in December of 1821, you can see here in this quote, the thing they identify as the most pressing problem facing Mexico as a nation is, as they say here, the security of the province of Texas, all right? It would be, as they said, an irreparable loss to the empire if this beautiful province is lost. And so the only way for them to save Texas for themselves and to save Mexico as a nation is to populate Texas. And what they mean is Texas up here, you guys can see this on the map, up here on this border with the United States, is so underpopulated because the Spanish have failed so poorly to control the region that it leaves the rest of Mexico very vulnerable to an invasion from the United States and anything else that might follow, all right? So Stephen F. Austin is seen as a solution to these problems. So Mexico kind of inherits a solution in the form of Stephen F. Austin from the Spanish. And he's getting the support again of the Tejanos like um, Jose Antonio Navarro here, all right? So Austin, Steve we'll call him, he leaves San Antonio and he's heading out to find where he's gonna place his colony. And so, you know, he, he heads back toward, toward the United States, but he's looking for an uh, area where he can, he can build his colony. And, and I always ask my students at this point, I'd stop lecturing and, and ask them, where would you put the colony if you were Stephen F. Austin, right? And they come up with lots of ideas about that. Some of them say near the coast so they can get supplies. Other folks just throw out random crazy ideas far away from the Comanches as they can get, stuff like that. But I always remind them, like, what are Stephen F. Austin's goals here? What is his driving idea? And it's to build a colony of farmers, cotton farmers, right? So what is he looking for? He's looking for really good land that will attract cotton farmers from the United States. And so what he's looking for are territories that will look a lot like Mississippi, look a lot like Alabama or Louisiana, the places where they are growing cotton in large quantities, and he hopes to replicate a lot of that success. So Austin is looking around the rivers, all right? He starts focusing on the Brazos and the Colorado rivers, and there's a couple reasons for that. 
one, you know, if you, there's rich, rich soils down there, all right, down near the coast. And he recognizes the soils are really good, that they're going to be similar to what you'd find in Mississippi. That lily bodes very well. Um, the rivers are good for irrigation, if you're going to be trying to water your, your, your crops and things like that. But the main advantage of the rivers is that they are the highways of the 19th century, right? If you're going to be moving people, goods, supplies, commerce, anything and everything that you're going to want to, to be able to transport, the rivers are the ways you're going to do that. There's no serious roads in Texas at this time, right? There's the Camino Real and things like that, but those are just horrible bumpy trails more than anything else. And so the Brazos and Colorado rivers are pretty big rivers. They'll be great for shipping. And if you're going to be cotton farmers, what are you going to be shipping besides supplies coming in? You're going to be shipping bales of cotton going out. You use 450 pound blocks, these massive um, you can see here in this picture right here on the bottom left, these are cotton bales, right? You're going to be shipping that down the river. And you can see in this, this painting out here on the river, there's a steamboat out there. You need to have very big steamships to be able to come up and get cotton bales and drag them down the river. So that is the kind of area that Stephen F. Austin is looking for. And so he finds it along the Colorado and Brazos rivers, right? This is a sketch, uh, a map that Austin did of the territories that were going to be his colony. It's going to be close to the coast because you need the mouths of those rivers for shipping things and people in and out. And so he decides these are the places he's going to set up his colony around these two rivers. And now that he's found his place, he has the support of the Tejanos in San Antonio. He needs to start attracting Americans. So he's going to start advertising to people in the United States. And this is a fun thing to talk about with students um, because yeah, uh, today you have to say, I would ask them like, how would you advertise something? And they come up with lots of ideas, usually Twitter, Instagram, or something like that, but it's all online sort of stuff. And I explained to them, not only that there was no internet back then, but that news traveled in very different ways in the 19th century. And the main way that news traveled in the 19th century is that newspapers around the country would reprint news articles from other newspapers, right? So if there was a newspaper, if you had a newspaper in New York, for example, you would get newspapers, you would subscribe to newspapers from all over the United States. So you get newspapers from like Richmond, Virginia, and you get uh, St. Louis, Missouri, New Orleans, Louisiana. And when those newspapers got up to you, you would find the most interesting or salacious news articles and you would you, you cut them out, like the original cut and paste, and you would replicate them in your newspaper and reprint them. And so a rumor or a story from New Orleans might get reprinted newspapers in Lexington, Kentucky, or you know, Salem, Massachusetts, because it's being reprinted by other newspaper um, places around the country. So that's how Stephen F. Austin spread news about his colony. He wrote letters to the New Orleans newspapers, which were the closest ones, and because New Orleans is such an international port, he knew those newspapers would go all over the United States, and they did. And then they would reprint his news and his, his offer for colonists all over the United States. And so if you're going to do that, and you're Stephen F. Austin, right, you're going to try to call this, you know, the next Eden, right? This is the land of milk and honey that you guys can see on the screen right here. This is a, a quote uh, from a letter Stephen F. Austin sent to a friend in New Orleans that got reprinted in the New Orleans newspapers describing Texas as, what well, you can see right here, one of the few spots on the globe that could furnish uh, to, a, to an equal extent on this level. The, this place is the most rich, beautiful, amazing area you could ask for, right? That's how he's advertising it. But that's not enough to attract most Americans, right? Because they all heard there's great land in Kentucky or there's great land in Mississippi. Like that's not gonna be enough. He's gotta sweeten the deal. And fortunately for Austin, he's got a lot of wonderful things he can offer people in the United States, all right? So in the newspaper articles, if you read them in the time, it would say any man who comes to Stephen F. Austin's colony was only men who were eligible for these things. But if you're a man with a family. You, if you come to Austin's colony, are eligible to receive 4,428 acres, right? I know you guys know that and probably tell your students that. That's an enormous amount of land. I always explain to my students that's seven square miles of land. Somehow that makes it a little more concrete for them to think of seven square miles of land. It's an obscene amount of land, right? And far more than you could ever hope to own in the southern United States. Um, 
But that's, you know, that's not all. You get more land for the more people that you bring, right? So do you have a wife? Great, bring her with you. You get 200 more acres for bringing your wife. She doesn't get 200 acres, you do, but you get 200 more acres for bringing your wife, all right? So if you're a married man, you're gonna get more land. Do you have kids? Of course you do, it's the 19th century, right? Everybody has 400 kids. So every one of those you bring, every one of your children who come, you, the head of the family, get another 100 acres for every child that you bring. So there's a premium, as you can see here, not just for men showing up, but for men with families, which for Austin meant more stable people, people who are more willing to invest in the land long term, all that good stuff. And so you could get quite a bit of land just literally for showing up. But he's also trying to attract cotton farmers and people with real money and investments to be made in, in Texas. So he also offered an additional 50 acres for every enslaved person that you brought with you, right? So he's putting a premium on land distribution, not just to men with families, but also men who are wealthy enough to own slaves, who are gonna be cotton planters, right? Who could help again, develop the region with cotton the way that Stephen F. Austin is intended, right? And what this all adds up to is way more land than you could ever hope to buy in the United States. There's no way you could afford this for almost anybody um, on your own in the United States. But if you go to Texas, you could have all of this. Now, there were some requirements. And Austin said those very clearly in the advertisements from the very word go. You had to be Catholic. And you can see I put wink, wink right next to that because you know, Spain was a Catholic country. Mexico was going to be a Catholic, a Catholic country as well. That was never up for debate. And that was never possible for that not to be the case at this time. And so Austin knew that um, it was in his contract that his father had gotten from the Spanish that these had to be Catholics who were coming to Texas. And that was in the advertising. And that did stop a good number of Americans who thought about coming to Texas, who were not willing to pretend to be Catholic or even convert to actual Catholicism. Um, I put wink, wink here because it never got enforced. This is one of those things that was pretty much on paper. And you know we know that now, but you gotta understand most Americans before they made the trip to Texas would not have known that. And so that's why it was a barrier for, for many people coming in. It never gets enforced because Mexico never has the ability to enforce it in Texas or even really the will to do it, but it's officially on paper, all right? You did need to bring what are called letters of good character. We would call these recommendation letters today, all right? And so Austin was looking for, you know, people of good character, not someone who just broken out of prison and felt like getting some land. And they took this seriously. People took this very seriously. And so people showed up in his colony, brought letters uh, attesting to their good, their good character and the fact that they weren't criminals of various sorts. More pressing is that you actually did need some money. And it looks like you can just show up and get seven square miles of land for nothing. And on paper, that's true. But in reality, you did actually need some money. And that was because while the land was free, getting legal title to it was not free. Um, Austin, it had to be surveyed. It had to be mapped. Paperwork had to be filed with Mexico. And you had to be issued a title. There's a lot of administrative stuff that went into all of that. And so Stephen F. Austin, this is one of the ways Austin's going to make money on being an impresario, a land agent, is that while the land was free, Austin would charge you 12 and a half cents to survey and procure all the legal documents. And you can see here that that was about 500 something bucks. It's not nothing, but the nice thing is Austin will give you easy credit terms and you can pay him and pretty much anything. I mean, he would take chickens, he would take enslaved people. Um, but what most people paid him with was some of their land. So if you had seven square miles of land, probably didn't need all of it, you might be able to give Austin one of those square miles of land and that'll pay off all your legal fees. And then you still have six square miles of land. Austin got another square mile himself and then both of you are happy and go on from there. So that's one reason you did need at least some money or at least be willing to give up some of your land. But you definitely needed some money because you had to bring, at least what Austin recommended to everybody, is that you bring a year's worth of supplies. And why is that? Because there's no Home Depot 
anywhere in Texas. There's no Walmart, there's no Amazon. You wanna see my students' faces go scrunching up with confusion when I say there's no Amazon Prime and you just can't get things delivered to your, your doorstep in two days or one day. There's no way to get anything. This is the far frontier. You really need to front everything you're gonna to need to survive for a whole year because it may take you that long to get in, a, uh, not just a cotton crop, but corn that you're gonna eat, building yourself a house, all that sort of stuff. So you need all of that on hand. So Austin makes those advertisements. He sends them to the Southern United States. He gets, well, the whole United States. And then he gets a massive reaction um, from people across the United States. He gets letters from people all over asking about his colony, asking if they can come. Stephen F. Austin very quickly realizes that he could probably settle way more than just 300 families, which is what he'd been originally given permission to settle. And so this is, I love this quote. Austin wrote this, he wrote a letter to um, San Antonio where the Tejanos were. And he said, you can see, I could take on 1500 families as easily as 300 if permitted to do so. He's like, let me bring in even more. And the Tejanos say, Let's start with 300 and see what we get to. So Austin opens the floodgates and Americans come pouring in by the hundreds. And so the way that people came to Austin's colony is that there were really two ways to get there from the Southern United States. You could either come overland uh, in wagons from Natchitoches, come through Nacogdoches here down the Camino Real and then come to the Brazos and the Colorado rivers here. Or what most people prefer to do was to go to New Orleans where you could buy supplies. Remember you need a year's worth. And then you get on a boat and then you would float on that boat over to the mouth of the Brazos and the Colorado rivers over here. And then you would make your way in. You would come up to Stephen F. Austin's colony. Austin established the, the heart of his colony was the town of San Felipe de Austin which you can actually visit today. They've rebuilt very recently part of the original village there and they've got a world-class museum. I highly recommend it. It's near Sealy, Texas off of I-10 today. Um, but back then you'd come into the colony, you'd go up to San Felipe, that's where Stephen F. Austin's house was. And you would present yourself to him and say, hey, I'm here, I'm here for my land. Got my letters of recommendation. You can check those out. I swear to goodness, I'm Catholic. Austin would check all that off and then he'd tell you, all right, head out. And you got to survey and decide where you wanted your own land. Assuming it wasn't already taken, you could wander up and down either the Colorado or Brazos rivers and pick the area that you liked the best. And then tell Austin that's what you wanted. He'd help um, survey it out and send you off from there. And so people came pouring in. People like this guy, Jared Gross which I like to talk about Jared Gross for a lot of reasons. Um, the main one is that he really represents the kind of people who are coming into Stephen F. Austin's colony. Jared Gross was a southerner. He was from Virginia. He owned a, a large number of enslaved people and he made a lot of money during the cotton revolution we talked about last week. So during the 18 teens, when prices are going way up, he moves to Alabama and makes a whole lot of money. But then the panic of 1819 happens and he loses a lot of things. Looks like he's going to lose a whole lot more when he hears about Stephen F. Austin's colony and reads an article in the newspaper that explains all these amazing terms. And so Jared Gross here picks up shop, takes his 90 slaves that he has with him, and he comes over to Stephen F. Austin's colony in 1822. He's one of the earliest colonists, one of the wealthiest colonists. And he really is the kind of person that Stephen F. Austin was looking for, an established, wealthy cotton farmer with a lot of enslaved people, with a big family that will help develop the colony. And so Jared Gross came in and built a plantation that became known as Bernardo. This is not a sketch of that plantation, it's a, but it is a sketch of a Texas farm from the 1840s that would look very similar to what these farms would have looked like. And you can see you know, this cabin right here is the big house. These are slave cabins in the background over here. And you know, they're carving out plantations on the far frontier. It's a lot like early Mississippi, a lot of like early Alabama, and it's very, very profitable. And I tell that story about Jared Gross because I mean, no one else in Austin's colony was as wealthy as Gross, but 
all of them came from the same region that Jared Gross came from. Virtually everybody who came to Stephen F. Austin's colony had come from the American South, places like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, or Virginia and Georgia and Tennessee and Arkansas. Um, 90%, that's nine zero, 90 percent of all the colonists who came to Stephen F. Austin's colony were from the southern regions, all right? And why is that? It's very simple, because Texas was seen as cotton country, and it's an expansion of the cotton frontier in Mississippi, Alabama, and all these places. So they're coming from Mississippi and not Maine. They're coming from Alabama and not Illinois, and that's going to matter long term because these are going to be Southerners who are moving into the region with cotton culture. And for that reason, it wasn't just cotton farmers who were coming in. They're also bringing with them slavery and enslaved people. They're bringing Mississippi into Mexico. And so from the very beginning of Stephen F. Austin's colony, there's a large percentage of enslaved people who are being brought in as a part of this cotton economy. Uh, the first census of Stephen F. Austin's colony was done in 1825. And when they did the census, they found that 25%, a full quarter of everybody in Stephen F. Austin's colony were enslaved people, men, women, and children who were working in the cotton fields, right? Just as you would have found in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and on from there, all right? And they're helping make this colony incredibly successful, incredibly um, profitable as cotton production starts booming in Austin's colony. Jared Gross establishes one of the very first uh, cotton gins in the colony. They're starting to produce all of this. Stephen F. Austin fills his, his contract of 300 families very, very quickly. And a lot of development happens up and down the river, just like the Tejanos in San Antonio have been hoping for. So you can see this map right here. This is a map of Stephen F. Austin's colony. And this is actually a map that Austin made to show where everybody's um, plantations were, where they're getting it. So you can see they everybody had riverfront property. So J.P. Coles here, Asia Mitchell, S. Carter, J.P. Bailey, they all have riverfront territory. So it's kind of like having access to the road because everything is shipped up and down there. And you can see Austin's getting a whole bunch of land and territory here that's going to make him rich. You can see down here on the right, that's J.E. Gross. That's Jared Gross. He's getting huge amounts of land as well. And everybody here is doing pretty darn well. There's only one problem. Mexico has approved none of this. Remember, all this is happening provisionally because Mexico had just become a new nation. There's no government in Mexico City when Stephen F. Austin gets started to approve any of this. And so as a result, Austin's doing all this on a wing and a prayer hoping that the Mexican government will end up supporting him. And so when Mexico starts building its first government down in Mexico City, Austin is being very focused on trying to make sure that they support his colony. So I'm going to pause there and hand the mic over to my colleague, Michelle, who's going to take you guys through some resources here. All right. Um, it's good to see everybody this Monday evening. Hopefully you guys survived the day. Hopefully you guys have some uh, a short week coming up or like you're on a short week right now um, because of the holiday. Uh, we're going to start here with the primary source documents. This looks a little bit familiar because it, it is kind of like a rendition or a copy paste from last week, not really a copy paste, but um, the purpose of it is simply just to give you guys an elongated version um, of the of an inquiry. We gave you the first version of the inquiry last week. Um, this one should link nicely with it. Uh, so you guys can take uh, last week's inquiry, this inquiry, and the one that we're building for next week um, and use them all three hand in hand uh, just to, uh, to go over the, the making of Mexican Texas uh, in your classroom. So uh, I'm going to introduce the primary for set. Today, we have a primary source set one and primary source set two. We've shortened it for you guys so that uh, it really doesn't take six weeks to go through this, uh, this entire document because we know uh, time is limited. So I, I'm gonna introduce the very first primary source set that I've got. It's all, the primary source set one is all about the making of Austin's colony. And um, one of the biggest struggles that I have in my own classroom is uh, really, doing a good job of outlining the requirements that Austin has for his colony um, and 
also um, outlining some information about exactly like where it is, like where it's located and the fact that it's not under Spain anymore, right? Mexico, in fact, is the one who, um, who he's answering to now. And so making that transition is a really hard, hard thing to do in a seventh grade class. So hopefully this document set will help. Um, the very first primary source document is all about uh, Stephen F. Austin's land grant. It really sets it up nicely. Um, these words are from Stephen F. Austin himself. Uh, if you've ever read any of his letters from start to, to end, you know that this guy is, is the guy full of vocabulary and he loves, I think he loves to either hear himself talk or, or watch himself write because he, he's got a lot to say. Uh, so this is very, very shortened, a, a small snippet of what he wrote to, um, to Joseph Hawkins. Um, I, the part that I love about this most uh, is really like he outlines uh, the settlers, uh, the type of settlers. Like I, I'm looking for a particular kind of person in this. And so, um, and also he, he mentions this great stuff here that this is entirely agriculture. Uh, he, he talks about the great soil and the climate and all the things that would um, draw people to Texas. Uh, the next primary source document is is just Stephen F. Austin writing a letter or an advertisement um, that he later put in uh, newspapers in New Orleans and further into the United States just to advertise this land grant and to get people interested in it. Um, he, he also goes into uh, the amount of land that he proposes. These numbers are different than the numbers that Dr. Torget showed us. Um, simply because this was his first rendition of, of I, well, I could possibly give these, you know, this many acres to, to married women. Um, so he outlines them out right down here at the very bottom. Um, and then uh, he also talks about, like, if you bring 10 slaves, you would get an additional 1,300 acres, um, really kind of making people uh, making slave owners more interested in uh, coming to Texas and um, selling it on that. So um, the next primary source document is from Stephen F. Austin, but he this is him permitting somebody to actually come and live in his, his colony. Uh, this is where it talks about the fact that Stephen F. Austin is getting paid. A lot of my students are like, why is he doing this for free? This sounds like a whole lot of work and he's not getting paid because all of this land is free, but in fact, it's not. Um, right inside of the middle of this document, he says $12.50 per 100 acres. The students may have to do a little bit of math on that um, to figure out that it's actually 12 and a half cents per acre. Uh, that's OK. That's a little cross content for them. Um, and again, it breaks it out just a little bit down here uh, as far as acres per person or, or um, per family go. Um, and then the very last document that I've got for you guys uh, is Stephen F. Austin to the, the immigrants that he's finally approved, right? Um, he's gone through all of these uh, letters requesting uh, approval into, his, in, into Austin's colony. And so he's finally made most of his selection, uh, but he's going to lay down the law with them because uh, the, the one thing that I want my student, not the one thing, but one of the many things I want my students to know is that he's responsible to the Mexican government. Like it's the, the pressure's on and Stephen F. Austin um, is an attorney himself. And so he very much understands law and, um, and is, is very much willing to work for making his, his colony successful. And he knows what that means. Um, so he's outlined it very nicely um, about the conduct that he expects inside of his, uh, inside of his colony. So, this uh, this goes very nicely. There's there is uh, a great resource inside of the portal, uh, not the portal anymore. Texas History for Teachers, um, and it's called "Who Wants to Be an Empresario?" I use I've used that in my classroom um, for several years, and the students love it. It's a it's a fun activity. They get to choose who's going to be in their colony, um, and so this sets that this works very very well um, with that particular. Um, activity. So if you use that in your classroom, this 
this makes that make sense if that if that makes sense to you guys. Um, another another portion of this obviously is uh, the let me see if I can access it. Give me one second. Um, I've got to move some toolbars around. Another portion of this is is simply the um, instructions that we've got for you guys or the the slides that we've got. The slides are are basically all of the information all mushed together um, that makes this presentable uh, and ready to go inside of a classroom for you guys. I'm going to point a couple of things out. Uh, we've still got the guide for analyzing primary source text in here. You can remove it if if you've already gone through that with your students. That's totally fine. Um, we've got another intro scenario uh, just so that students can go ahead and wrap their brain around uh, getting started on another inquiry. Um, and that's a quick T chart for them. Uh, we do have an embedded video. The Smithsonian made a really fabulous video about colonization in Texas, uh, but I've got it clipped to just under a minute because that's all of the information that I want my students to have. I'm not going to give them the additional information inside of the video because it kind of like it's a spoiler alert for them. So just this the small snippet of background information. Um, and then we move on to the first guiding question, which is exactly what Dr. Torget was talking about and what were Stephen F. Austin's primary goals in establishing his colony. This is important um, because later on when the other colonies are established, uh, uh, the other empresarios have different, very obviously different goals than Stephen F. Austin. And that uh, is where the problems start. So um, in addition to that, we've got some supporting questions that help students think through the process um, of, of trying to answer the compelling question, the first compelling question. These things are also in the student document that I'm not going to um, show you right now because you guys have access to that. So I, this is all of the information I have for the very first part um, of, of this inquiry. And then Jay will give you uh, the second part to this inquiry after Dr. Torgett uh, gives his historical knowledge on it. All right, Dr. Torgett, that's all I've got. I'm going to um, hand it back to you. Okay, thank you. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, Michelle. That's beautiful. Um, I love primary source <laughs> materials, and there's so much to do with it. Um, okay, so I'm going to pick back up the story. Um, whereas, remember, things are going gangbusters with Austin's colony. People are pouring in. Some not voluntarily because they're enslaved and being brought in. But from the Anglo and Tejano perspective, this is going as, about as well as it possibly could. But again, there's a problem. Mexico has improved none of this. So one of the challenges I think in teaching this period is that there's so much going on. There's what's going on in Texas, in Austin's colony or with the Tejanos in San Antonio. But there's also the fact that Mexico as a nation is forming itself and that is a really important part of the story because they're going to create a government. They're going to create a constitution called the Constitution of 1824. And, you know, that is going to be the touchstone going forward that's going to help lead ultimately in parts to the Texas Revolution. So trying to understand those different pieces simultaneously, I mean, it's a lot for anybody, but particularly for, you know, seventh graders if we're teaching, um, teaching seventh grade social, uh, social studies. So... One of the things that I always try to do is, is take a time out in the middle of the story of Stephen F. Austin's colony so that people, I can tell my students about what's going on at the same time in Mexico City. And I wrap it around creating the, the, the government in Mexico, the, the, the constitution of 1824 as it emerges, right? Because you guys know, in terms of Teeks, constitution of 24 shows up um, when we get to the revolution and everything like that. So I always frame this with what, what was so important about the Constitution of 1824 and how does it affect Texas? That's gonna be an important shaper. And as a part of that, we understand hopefully what the difference is between federalism, which is what the Constitution of 1824 did and centralism, um, which is authoritarianism essentially, um, how those played a major role in what was going on in Texas. So again, the second essential question I have here is 
not just what was important about the Constitution of 24 and its effects on Texas, but why was embracing federalism, this idea that the states have certain powers and rights versus Mexico City, why was that really important for Mexico? Because it helps us understand, again, not just Mexican Texas, but the road to conflicts that will ultimately culminate in the Texas Revolution and the secession of Texas from Mexico. So you're laying groundwork here that is going to pay off big dividends and help your students really understand more deeply, I think, when you get to 1835 and 36, all right? So again, we put Austin's colony on hold for a second. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, down in Mexico City, you know, Mexico's creating a country and that's no small task. You imagine the chaos after 10 years of civil war in Mexico against the Spanish, suddenly you're independent, you're your own nation and what do you do with that, right? How do you form a new government? That was the driving question in 1821. In 1821, Stephen F. Austin is trying to figure out how do I create my colony? At the same moment in Mexico City, they're trying to figure out how do we create a government for this country, all right? And so they got a couple of choices on how to form a government. The, the first thing they do, the first type of government they try is a monarchy, all right? And they make Augustin de Iturbide, you guys remember him from a little earlier. He's the guy who wins Mexico's independence officially uh, in 1821. And uh, there's a movement in Mexico City to make him um, the emperor of Mexico. He's, he's crowned Emperor Augustin I. And the reason they did this is because you know, what had Spain been? It had been a monarchy. And so you know, the system in place that had been there before that they had rebelled against, yes, but that's what they knew, and that's what it looked like they might be able to, to put into place for stability reasons. And so they try out this monarchy situation, which when you talk later with your students about federalism versus centralism, this is centralism. This is centralizing authority in someone like an emperor, in this case, in Mexico City. So they, they go towards this very centralized monarchy situation in 1821, 1822, and they, they crown this guy emperor. Long story about this. Um, I have to give you the short version because we don't have time. It does not work out well. Turns out that kings and emperors tend to be tyrants and uh, Iturbide gets pretty tyrannical pretty quickly. He starts jailing people who don't agree with him. He dissolves the Mexican Congress and throws some of those guys in jail. And basically he doesn't even last a year. They throw him out, he gets exiled from the country, and that's the end of that. So Mexico has a very early, not very pretty experience with monarchy, and that just kind of goes out the window. So since they tried monarchy, didn't work too well, they decide to go to the other side of the possibility. So if you had centralism and monarchy on this one side, they decide, what if we tried the opposite? What if we went and had a federal republic? kind of like the United States is set up, all right? They're not exactly modeling themselves after the United States, and I want to make that very, very, very clear. Um, but we can use for our students, I think it's a really good analogy that they're doing to do something very similar, where the United States, the national government in Washington, D.C. has certain powers, and the states have certain powers. That is what Mexico wants to set up as a federal, which is to say divided between the national government and the state governments, a federalized system, um, that will hopefully give Mexico some stability and allow them to thrive you know, much like the United States was thriving at the time, right? So Mexico calls a national convention in 1823 for people from all over Mexico to come and gather in Mexico City to help write a, a new national constitution, right? So uh, one of you guys was talking about George Washington as president, right? This is sort of that moment in Mexico City where they're, they're writing a new constitution and creating a new government and seeing what that will look like. And so people come down to Mexico City. Um, all the provinces in Mexico sent people. Me Texas sent a man named Erasmo Seguin, one of the Tejano leaders in Mexico City or in San Antonio to go down to Mexico City and they, they gathered here. So what you're seeing here is an image of what was known as the House of Deputies in Mexico City. It's kind of sort of the equivalent of the House of Representatives for the United States. And so all these guys came around and they started talking about what kind of country Mexico should be. They all agreed it should be Catholic. 
But beyond that, they really couldn't agree on pretty much anything. So, um, so Mexicans started arguing about all kinds of different aspects, debating each other, trying to figure out what they wanted to be. All right. One of the big questions was, will Mexico allow um, American colonization to continue? And this came up very quickly and very early because Mexico recognized that Moses Austin had gotten this deal. And the question was, should they allow that to happen? Would that be a good idea? Would that be a safe idea? And what's remarkable about this is that American colonization, as you can see on the screen here, proves to be not controversial. And that surprised a lot of people. That surprised Stephen F. Austin. Because Stephen F. Austin, while his colony is being built up, he recognizes that the decisions made in Mexico City are going to affect his colony and decide whether or not he gets to keep going on his, his enterprise. And so Stephen F. Austin actually went all the way down to Mexico City during this time to be a part of these debates. He's not an official representative of Texas, but he goes down there to be a part of these debates and he, he rides all the way down to Mexico City and he's pleasantly surprised to find that most Mexican legislators from all over Mexico agree that this is actually something we wanna have. We wanna have American colonization in Texas. Um, and the reason is because they recognized they needed more people in Texas, especially people who are not Comanches. Um, but a lot of it was also because these Mexican legislators recognized what the Tejanos in San Antonio recognized, which is that the cotton economy in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana was so profitable and so powerful that bringing that to Texas would have a real positive, hopefully, real positive long-term economic influence, not just on Texas, but possibly all of Mexico itself. It would bring in new people who will become Anglo-Mexicans, but it'll also bring in new economic development into the region that could be broadly enriching. And therefore it'd be more stable and it'd be good for Mexico in lots of ways. And this is a way to control the Americans who might try to come in anyway, instead of having them invade or come in secretly as filibusters and things like that, invite some in, control them legally and turn them into Anglo-Mexican citizens is the idea, all right? So when Stephen F. Austin is in Mexico City and the Rasmus Seguin from Texas are in Mexico City, they're both amazed to find that most Mexicans agree, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Maybe not their first choice, but it's the least bad option available to Mexico to try to stabilize Texas. And it comes with a lot of really big upsides of bringing in the American economy, right? And so Stephen F. Austin is like high-fiving Erasmus Seguin. Right? They're feeling pretty good about all this stuff. But they do run into a snag. Is that it's, there is actually something that is controversial about bringing in these Americans, right? What was controversial? It wasn't that these Americans are going to come into Mexico. It isn't that all these Anglos are going to be moving into Texas. It's the labor system that those Americans propose to bring with them from Mississippi into Mexico. And so what became controversial in Mexico City about what was going on in Texas was the fact that these cotton farmers who are coming to Austin's colony are bringing slavery with them and enslaved people to these new farms and plantations, all right? And this, if you're, gonna, if you're writing notes, write slavery down at this moment because this becomes the point of dispute between those in Texas and legislators in Mexico City. Because if there was one thing besides Catholicism that most Mexicans could agree on at this time, it's that they wanted to get rid of slavery at the moment Mexico became independent, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, <sighs> Mexico, when it becomes independent in 1821, for one thing, so reason number one, Mexico does not have African chattel slavery in most Mexican states, right? And I say that I wanna emphasize that Mexico had imported slaves from Africa in very large numbers in the 1500s and in the 1600s to work in the silver mines um, in central Mexico. But that turned out to be very, very expensive. And because the death rates were very high in those silver mines, it became cheaper, easier, and more efficient for Mexico to enslave the local Indian populations, 
near these mines. And so that replaced African slavery in Mexico for the next several centuries. Um, so much so that by 1821, you really don't have enslaved African-Americans in almost any part of, of Mexico. And so you could get rid of slavery without giving up very much. You know, From Yucatan all the way up to California, there really wasn't much African slavery, the way it was practiced in the Southern United States. And so Mexico could just get rid of it without really sacrificing anything. So that's reason number one. Reason number two that most Mexicans wanted to outlaw slavery is because um, it was um, both, it, um, it was not a part of the economy in any sort of serious way. So it was very easy um, to get rid of without sacrificing anything, all right? So for them, it was, a, it was an easy moment to get rid of that, especially coming out of the revolution where they had been fighting for independence and liberty and freedom and they wanted to live up to a lot of those ideals, all right? The same controversy you see in the United States where Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, folks like that um, recognize that having fought for liberty and independence and freedom, they are now stuck with this question of do they keep slavery in this new nation? For a lot of Mexicans, that was you know, a clear choice that they wanted to separate themselves from while not having really to sacrifice economically much of anything to do with, all right? So that's the second reason. But the third reason is the most important. And if you only write down one reason, this is the one to write down, which is Mexico is a new nation and they need international friends if they're gonna survive, right? They need other countries to recognize them, to make trade agreements with them and to loan them money. And the most powerful uh, nation in the world in this period was Great Britain, not the United States, it's Great Britain. and who happens to also own the vast majority of Mexican debt at this time? It's Great Britain. Who's going to be able to lend them money? London is the, the, seed, uh, the seat of international commerce at this time, so it needs to be the British. And who also happens to be the leader in trying to stamp out the international slave trade by the 1820s at this time? It's also Great Britain. All right. So if Mexico is going to go forward as a nation, it has to be on good terms with the British. And if they're going to go forward and have good terms with the British, they cannot endorse slavery. And they recognize that. So for almost all Mexicans, they agreed, if we're going to go forward as a nation and we're going to survive, we need to get rid of slavery. This is our moment when we're getting our country built up from the ground up. All right. There's only one part of Mexico where you're hearing voices saying anything different. And that's Texas. And that's not a small thing. All right, from Texas, you're hearing from people like Stephen F. Austin down here on the right, and Tejanos, again, this is Jose Antonio Navarro. It's actually Erasmo Seguin, but we don't have a picture of him, um, who's in Mexico City for the Tejanos. But both Moses, or sorry, Moses, Stephen F. Austin and the Tejanos in Mexico City are saying, we can't get rid of slavery because if we do, no Americans are gonna leave Mississippi and Alabama and come to Texas to establish farms because they're not gonna abandon the labor system that made those farms so profitable in Mississippi to come to Mexico if we outlaw slavery, all right? So this becomes a big point of controversy in Mexico City. And Stephen F. Austin and the Tejanos go around to every Mexican legislator and they lobby as hard as they can saying, please don't get rid of slavery. And you know, there's a million ways that Stephen F. Austin said this. There's a million ways that some of the Tejanos said this. I just, I got two quotes here that really encapsulate it, right? But here's Stephen F. Austin talking about this, and he says, you can read with me, but the primary product that will elevate us from poverty is cotton, and we cannot do this without the help, I like the word help there, that's, a, that's quite the euphemism there, but the help of slaves, right? He's saying, we're going to grow cotton, we need slaves. That's just the equation, that's how it is. We didn't create this, but if we're bringing it from Mississippi, that's how it works. And the Tejanos understood this. They'd seen it firsthand, they recognized it. And so you can see right here, Erasmus Seguin, he was writing a, a letter talking about this. And he said, tell Austin, I am well aware that abolition of the slaves will hinder immigration. So if slavery gets outlawed, it's going to destroy the Austin colony, is what Stephen F. Austin believes, it's what the Tejanos believe. And so they go around through the, the halls of the, the House of Deputies here, lobbying every member of the Constitutional Convention saying, you can't get rid of slavery. And Stephen F. Austin said, he said, look, I don't like slavery. I don't want to keep it forever. He said, I don't own any slaves. 
he actually did own several slaves from time to time, but he was trying to sell it as a temporary measure, anything he could do to convince the legislature to at least keep it legal for now so that we can bring in Americans and stabilize Texas and get this economic development going. That's how he tried to sell it. So Austin screamed and yelled as much as he could. Erasmus Seguin did the same. And then debate finally ended and Stephen F. Austin left Mexico City. He doesn't know the outcome. Austin came back to Texas to, to work on his colony, and he's waiting to find out what ultimately the Constitutional Convention will decide. And the convention concluded its work in October of 1824. That's why it's called the Constitution of 1824, because they finish it that year. And they, they finish it in October, they publish it. And you know this is before the internet. So the only way you got news of that is you had to wait for a copy of the darn thing to arrive in Texas. And so it was published and it was sent north from there. Back in those days, the mail would arrive in Texas once a month. There was a writer who would come up from Northern Mexico who would first get to San Antonio and then make his way from there over to the colonies. But they wrote in and brought in the constitution of 1824. And you can imagine if you're in San Antonio when this constitution arrives, it's this really powerful moment where everybody's wondering what's gonna happen What's this going to look like? And so the Constitution arrives, they get it out, they read through it. And what are they looking for? They're looking for how the new government is structured. That's really important in all kinds of ways. But one of the main things they're looking for is what does it say about slavery? And the answer is, it doesn't say anything about slavery. Not one single word. And that wasn't an accident. That was very much on purpose. And this helps us, if you bring this up with your students, it helps you explain what federalism is because they didn't leave out the word slavery on accident. They did it on purpose because this is a federalist document. So let me explain what that means. So because it's a federalist document, they're sharing power in the government between the national government in Mexico City and the state governments in places like Texas or California or you know, um, Zacatecas or Yucatan. And everything that's named in this national constitution, everything that's described in this national constitution is something for the national government to do. So it talks about war, it talks about taxes, it talks about international relations with you know, nations like Great Britain. All of those things are tasks for the national government to do. Everything that is not named in this constitution is therefore a job for the states to do. So that means by not naming slavery in here, that was done very much on purpose. It means that Mexico is not gonna outlaw slavery at the national level. It will put that as, it will make that an issue for the states to decide for themselves, which this is also a great par parallel to US history. That is the same thing that the United States does. It makes slavery an issue for individual states to deal with. That is what Mexico does. And for Mexico, that was a brilliant solution because it meant that almost every single state across all of Mexico is going to outlaw slavery. Zacatecas will, Durango will, Chihuahua will, right? Um, Oaxaca, Chiapas, they'll all outlaw slavery. And so what Mexico can do is that Mexico can then tell the British, we've outlawed slavery. All the states have done it throughout all of Mexico. There's just, you know, this one weird corner, Texas, where that might not be true but everyone else would be, it would be outlawed. And you can see why that would be, give Mexico the ability to have its cake and eat it too. You can tell, you can tell um, Great Britain, we've outlawed it pretty much everywhere, but you can keep it legal in the one place it matters, in Texas. And this gets us to another point I wanna make about the Constitution of 1824. The reason they have a Federalist Constitution and they have a lot of power in the states is that that was a way to keep Mexico as a nation united and together. Mexico is a really big place when it's born in 1821, right? Back then it went from basically, um, you can see down here, Yucatan, Chiapas, all the way up to Northern California. It's a huge amount of land and a lot of very different people spread across a huge territory there. How do you keep them all working together? And how do you operate such a big place you need to give the states a lot of authority to make decisions for themselves about local issues of various sorts, all right? So this constitution, most Mexicans believe will help ensure the prosperity of Mexico by giving individual states the powers 
to make decisions about things that really matter to them. That's why federalism is going to be so important to them. That's why federalism under this constitution is gonna give the states enough power to thrive, to be able to make those local decisions that they need for their own circumstances. Because what's going on in Texas is very different than what's going on in Chiapas or California or Durango or Zacatecas or anywhere else in between. All right, all those places get to decide for themselves. So if you're in Texas and you're an Anglo or Tejano, obviously not an enslaved person, but if you're an Anglo or Tejano and you hear this and you hear about this constitution, you know, what's your reaction? Woo! You're excited because Texas theoretically is gonna get to decide all of its own issues and write its own constitution and decide all the major stuff like slavery and colonization and all those big, big issues that will decide the future of Texas will be yours to make. It's a very exciting moment. You feel like you've been empowered because you have been as all the states in Mexico are very empowered to make a lot of decisions for themselves, right? That's exciting. But then there's a downside for Texas because as they read through all these documents that arrive, they also recognize that Texas will not in fact be its own state under Mexico. I know you guys know this, but this is really important because Texas did not have enough people to be a state under Mexico. So Texas gets attached, you can see in this, in this map right here, it gets attached to its Southwestern neighbor, Coila, which had a lot more people, making the very big and very awkwardly named state of Coila y Tejas, all right? And that was hugely important for lots of reasons. One of which, and then we're gonna talk about this a lot next week, is that took power away from Texas because the capital of Texas is no longer San Antonio. The capital of Texas is the Coelan capital down here uh, in Saltillo, the capital of Coela. And these decisions about what Texas and Coela are gonna do are not gonna be made in Texas. They're gonna be made in Saltillo by the Coela, Texas legislature. And that legislature is going to be dominated by Coelans because there's a lot more of them than there are of Texans. The, the, the Coela, Texas legislature is gonna be 11 people. Only one of them will be a Texan. And so that one person from Texas could conceivably be outvoted on pretty much every issue as the Coelans get to decide a whole lot of stuff, all right? That will set us up for a lot of tensions that we're gonna talk about next week, all right? But for now, Texans are pretty excited. Anglos, Tejanos, they're very excited because this constitution of 1824 nonetheless promises local autonomy and power to make big decisions on things, again, like slavery, again, on colonization, all those sort of ways. So both Anglos and Tejanos, if you had taken a poll back then in 1825 of how things are going, they would have given you two thumbs up and said, things are pretty good. Things are pretty good. What's the situation? Well, first, Anglo-Americans had arrived in large numbers. Austin had fulfilled his colony, three, old 300 contract by settling 300 families. And I always point this out to students. I want to remind you guys, I know you know this, but that doesn't mean 300 people. That means more like 3,000 people. That means th 300 families in the 19th century is more like 3,000 people. So Austin has already brought in 3,000 people within just a couple of years. That's a giant step forward within Texas. All right. And the Tejanos remain highly supportive of it because not only is that bringing people in that are stabilizing the region, but it's bringing in this economic connection with the Southern United States and with New Orleans in particular, that's bringing money into the region. All right. It's bringing commerce into the region. It's bringing development into the region in a powerful way. But the thing that's standing out there is that Texas has been joined to Coila and that state Congress in Coila is going to write a new state constitution. It's going to decide all these major issues. And that ultimately is going to lead to a lot of conflict during the late 1820s and early 1830s. It's going to help us take us toward what will be ultimately the Texas Revolution. All right. So we'll talk about that next week. But by the time you get to 1825 here, Texas is thriving in Austin's colony. It's thriving in San Antonio as a result of all of this. And things are moving forward with this kind of cloud on the horizon of what that all might end up meaning. So I'm gonna pause there, and then I'm gonna hand this over to my colleague, Jay, who's got some more materials and resources for you guys. All right, thank you. 
Um, let me share my screen here. So what we tried to do on this was take a little bit what Dr. Torgut was talking about. In primary source one, you see letters from Stephen Faustin, and I kind of stayed on the same line. But in my primary source set, um, I took more of a slant of negative. The question is, did the Mexican government accept the colonization, Anglo colonization of Texas and then the institution of slavery that came along? So I kind of start back when um, Interbe is um, interred as the emperor and we see this Stephen F. Austin travels to Mexico City, as Dr. Torgut indicated, and he sees that everything's pretty much at a standstill. So he even says he's not really going to pursue it right now. And then we see a notation later on that the emperor dissolves the Congress. And the idea behind this is I, when I took Texas history as a seventh grader, and then even as I've been teaching, it's always been talking about Stephen F. Austin colonization. Yay, he wins. All this stuff goes. And the thing that, that's always been fascinating to me was the the backs the backstory of this with the um, the newly forming country of Mexico and the troubles that they went into and we and this here this primary source really gives us a good indication of the the conflict between that central control or that federal control um, so the idea behind it was to bring this in and have my students say hey wait a minute were they really this keen about it and then they're gonna hopefully see that this issue of slavery is gonna kind of muddy the waters. So then I jumped to 1823 where Austin's having a conversation with the Texas governor and the annoyance is that um, the law that he's trying to get passed um, and that he has to stay there and pester everybody just to get them to work on it. And then he ultimately says, I've been able to get this article passed um, and just showing the difficulty that it's, it takes Austin to do this. The man is working it seems like, you know, 24 seven. And then what I wanted to move on to is January 1st, where he has a conversation with Resmo Seguin to where then now they're starting to see in 1824, as the Mexican Congress, as Dr. Torgut is talking about, is saying, ah, this slavery thing's not a good idea because there's some bigger issues here. It's not the Anglo colonization. There's some other issues behind it as well, too. And then I finish with Resmo Seguin and Baron de Bastrop um, writing to each other where they have this conversation about um, yeah, we're in trouble. And, and as Dr. Torgut mentioned, and then they say, well, the Mexican government's decided to send over to us some vagrants or drifters to the colony, um, and then makes that notation, the abolition of slaves will hinder the immigration into Texas. So they're having this constant problem with it. And then when we get into the, um, the inquiry product that um, for the, the compelling question, um, you know, the idea that I'm really trying to get my students to think about that it's not just colonization, boom, we move on, is that this was a uh, political issue and this was a deeper issue for the students, but it also allows me to start teaching the, what is, why did government exist? So it gets to that government teaks where we're talking about um, what government is, because I know most of y'all for seventh graders at least, don't have a full knowledge of what government is and what it does. Um, and then it also allows us what did Mexican government, um, how do they feel about it? The economic perspective and then the governmental perspective. And, and again, you can modify these. This is the cool thing about this inquiry project. Everything that we're given to you is not meant to say, you have to do this with fidelity. It's meant more to say, here, here's, here's a way to inquiry, jump deeper into primary sources, um, get a sense from it. Um, and, you know, I know how I, there's two ways I would teach this, um, and each, each way is a little bit different from the next, but the, the big idea is creating that inquiry to where that now the students, after they've analyzed Michelle's um, primary sources with, about, with Stephen F. Austin, we still see how Stephen F. Austin with my primary sources is struggling. He's really having a hard time with this because the issue of slavery has become a, you know, a taboo topic for Mexico City and how is he gonna continue his colony and, and future immigration. This gives the students the ability to pick, um, did Mexico support Anglo colonization in Texas? You know, we could, you could actually add even some more background information talking about, you know, what Dr. Torres mentioned about Britain's debt or Mexico's debt to Britain um, and, you know, add that into a conversation starter as well too.